Curtain at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Could you tell me what schools did you go to to become the trumpeter, the instrumentalist you're right now, and also what did you have to do to become an expert at your field as an educator? Well, I went to, I had kind of a, a fairly normal um, background in music. I just came up through my local authority music uh, service in, in Bedfordshire and ended up going to uh, Salford University in Manchester, where I was lucky to find a great group of, of fellow students and colleagues and a few fantastic teachers that really kind of set me up. Uh, and that managed to get me just about good enough to come down to London and go to the Guildhall School of Music for their one-year postgraduate diploma. Uh, and that was it, really. That was the, the, the two bits of kind of formal uh, education in terms of colleges. And in terms of being an expert in, in, in teaching, it's just been a, a ongoing process of doing it, really, and, and always been very keen at, at watching amazing teachers, people like Nicky Isles and Pete Churchill and Simon Purcell, but, and, and lots of others that I've seen over the years and always kind of witnessed how brilliantly they structure information and break things down so that it can be understood in different ways. And they're the people that really made me, I think, understand the, the idea that if, if you can really own a piece of information, then it's something that you can... Uh, take on yourself and, and move forward with, you know, and that, that needs to be presented to students in a, in a very clear way. There's an amazing pianist uh, and teacher and composer and, and general sort of thinker about music called Liam Noble, who's a very good friend of mine. And we were teaching on a summer school in Glamorgan in, in Wales, which was a real learning curve for me. Again, Pete and Nicky were there and Simon Purcell and Jeff Simpkins, Dave Hassel, some amazing musicians. And and I remember at that time, it was new, it was I was fairly new to it. And it was, I think I was approaching teaching like it was something you, you had to, not pretend you were doing, but something that you had to try to do. It wasn't, it wasn't like a genuine extension of, how I felt as a musician myself, because I, I, I suppose I probably thought I didn't really have the experience for my own opinion about music to have any authority. And then when we were talking about, you know, in the pub and stuff later, we, and talking with Liam and also Julian Siegel was there about what they'd done with their bands and I could tell everything they were talking about was just like having a normal conversation with them about music. And it really dawned on me like, oh, yeah, you don't. This isn't something you have to affect in a different way to how you feel about music yourself. You know, this is it is OK to just have some faith in, in your own experience and what you think would make the music sound better and approach it from that starting point. And I've, I've never sort of gone back from that, really, that it is, it is connected to how you feel, and, and that's OK. What classes do you teach at the moment at the Rail Academy? What we teach as a programme is, is obviously a different question to what I teach individually myself. Mm -hmm. But it, as a degree programme, we try to um, cover all the expected bits of... Uh, of jazz education like repertoire and composition and uh, transcription and ear training, lots of ensembles and big bands, basically establish a, a kind of a model where you're you're going to be developing yourself artistically, but also very equipped and able to uh, serve other people's music and be adaptable and and ultimately I think to to be. Uh, purely practical about it to be employable because you do want people to be able to uh, to work and survive as a musician as well as be a creative artist uh, someone like Kenny Wheeler would be an amazing example of that someone who could 
do arrangements for Maynard Ferguson or uh, play commercial sessions and, and be a sideman to other jazz artists as well as do all of his own amazing work. That's a, that's a pretty good role model as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> And, but my, me, myself, I teach, obviously, with the trumpet lessons and uh, repertoire and improvisation classes, um, some, uh, like, professional development kind of seminars and uh, small ensembles. I take big band projects, lots of things like that. It's a, a, a good, good amount of variety. Hmm. Some of your students, then, have become very popular they are either former students of uh, yours or they are students at the moment in your school and they are already performing and gigging uh does your program provide any guidance throughout the music industry lessons we i mean we try to we try to uh to cover those kinds of things of course but they they do vary hugely depending on the the person and in the example of a uh, like one of the most well-known students uh, that that came through the academy of course being Jacob Collier he what happened to him was was so extraordinary and and a kind of unprecedented in a way that was in a situation like that it, you weren't really able to run you know seminars of oh here, here's what happens when Quincy Jones takes an interest in you you know <laughs> so, um It, it was so extraordinary that there was no kind of class for that. But I think in it on a on a much more uh, on a, on a level that's more common, I suppose, of of you know looking to release your own jazz projects or just deal with commercial freelance work, apply for funding for artistic projects, all that kind of thing. Mm. We would. Uh, we would attempt to, to talk about and, and make sure people were aware of but they're they're amazingly self-sufficient and and motivated group of uh, of students this this whole generation now i think are incredible at that so are there any pitfalls um, maybe the false assumptions about what it means to be a music student or professional musicians do you find any of these there not really i certainly nothing that's really consistent i think mm. everyone has their own kind of things that they that they're working through and figuring out about their relationship with music and where they want to go with it and i think all of us and especially when you're younger you have a tendency to want to feel like safe and part of a group and sometimes that means dividing the music up into scenes and and feeling like i belong in this one and therefore I'm not into this other thing. And so I, I think just trying to stay open-minded and positive about all of the options that are available to you, that's really important. But no, there's no, there's no consistent pitfalls like that. Mm. What is the auditioning process like in your school? Um, well, we, uh, we, we have a list of of tunes there's like a list of ballads and a list of, of swing tunes and you present one of each of those and then also bring in a composition because that's something we we really feel is at the heart of the of the program and at the heart of the community of young musicians is the fact that they all compose and write for each other um and uh Then there's like a, a short sort of harmony theory test, just basically things to check you'd be comfortable as as part of the department and and not get left behind. None of them are. It's the same with uh, the sight reading. None of those things are necessarily deal breakers, but they might just mean we are a bit better informed about how to support that particular person. What kind of advice would you have for first-year students that are entering your school, your program? So well, they... I think, for, I mean, it's probably a general advice for, for people going into into college rather than the, the academy specifically about just being super present in it. I think sometimes, if, especially if you go to conservatoire or, or jazz course music college in a big city it can be as exciting as it can be it can also be distracting 
And I think at least to begin with, allow yourself the chance to really be present in the department and in the school and get the most out of all the all the ensemble projects. It don't don't be looking constantly over your shoulder at what else is going on. Just learn to be very in the moment and committed to what you're doing. And uh, I I also think I, I, you often see the, the pressure of, of music college, the temptation to compare yourself with others and all of that kind of thing can be really uh, like a negative force in, in young musicians' development. And as much as is possible, I know that stuff is challenging for, for all of us, but as much as is possible, I think you have to just try and focus on your own journey and, and the, the target the kind of things you feel like you need to work on immediately or the long-term goals that you're just going to have to keep ticking away at but but not to get caught up into freaking out of of comparison of oh such and such can do this but they can't do that or because you that's not a game you can ever win it will only it will only ever distract or detract from what you're trying to do yourself mm -hmm. you, you got to remember why you sort of fell in love with this music in the first place and hang on to that because i think as as inspiring and busy and and motivating as as any jazz course can be it can also get intense and be kind of a bit overwhelming so so keeping a lifeline to what you really loved about the music in the first place and remembering why you wanted to do this i think that serves uh, it serves young students to begin with very well, you know. When they're leaving your course, what do your students usually do? What well, I mean, most of them are, are out working as musicians, I would have said. It, it's a very broad, as, as you know, for, for most musicians, it's a very broad and varied career, and there are as many types of careers as there are people. But the um, on the whole most of them are surviving doing what they set out to do and they're having very kind of meaningful creative lives but it's that's not to say it's not a challenge you know the living in expensive cities and trying to survive as a creative individual is always a, and i think always has been a, a very challenging thing but but most of them are doing it and that's uh, really encouraging and exciting to see our rewards may not be always the financial rewards, but the circumstances we'll find ourselves in, the people we are around, and the places we go to, we're incredibly fortunate uh, to actually be artists, to be musicians. Do you have any particular experience that led you towards uh, making the statement? It struck me recently talking to some old like friends that aren't musicians and i kind of realized they don't they don't really know anyone over 70 if you're not a music if you're not a musician if you work in an office or a something then colleagues that get to a certain age retire and maybe maybe you keep in touch with them or maybe not but i i realized that they thought it was kind of weird that some of my best friends are in their 70s. I could tell that just from the conversation that that was not something they had or they shared. And I just think it's it's really one of the most wonderful things in in my life is this connection with people of incredible experience and wisdom and generosity that are still searching and striving for exactly the same things they were and I am now and, and our students are right now. And that's a really deep and beautiful sort of part of our human existence that's not even available to, to someone in a different walk of life, or, or at least is not common. You'd have to make a point of trying to seek that out hmm. whereas to us it's it's absolutely standard you know i'll i'll sit in a trumpet section like a couple of weeks ago with nikki isles's uh, new big band which is amazing 
and the trumpets are Henry Lowther, who's 78, down to James Copas, who's sort of 25 or 26, you know, and, and we're all just friends, no problem. And I think that's an amazing, one of the one of the many amazing sort of rich rewards in life as as a musician that's got nothing to do with money, but it but it can change your life. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling and good to see you.